Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm Minister um, Elder Shoshana Walden with Fellowship Covenant Church, and we are finishing up our last study of Isaiah. We've gone through 16 sessions. Now, we're now at the 17th session. This is the last uh, bit of uh, the book of Isaiah that we are reviewing for this evening. We're uh, going to be looking at the final chapters. And boy, has this book been so interesting. This book has been um, uh, just uh, full of the glory of God, the promises of God, a glimpse into the New Testament. Um, I think Isaiah is just so wonderful um, because it really captures um, a little bit of what God was doing then and what God was going to plan for the future. So this great, great prophet was one of the prophets who foretold not only what was going to be happening and speaking to the current uh, a current culture and the current atmosphere and what God was going to do in the next, you know, five to ten years. Uh, but God was speaking centuries ahead of time. This was a prophet that foretold into the centuries. And so I remember when we started off with um, Elder James Dennis in the beginning of the introduction, he talked that, he said that is only 2% of the Old Testament prophets that really speak to the Messiah. But Isaiah was included in that 2% because he spoke of our coming Christ, the sovereign God coming in the form of a suffering servant. So uh, praise the Lord for this great, great prophet um, who really t foretold of uh, the wisdom of God, the love of God, the power of God, the sovereignty of God, um, and the majestic of our God. So let's just pray and let's begin our lesson. A great, great God, the Lord of our lives, the creator of the ends of the earth and all that we know of and even beyond, we give you praise and glory. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to learn of you. And we pray, Lord, that you uh, might bless me, Lord, to speak your word in such a way that might encourage and bless the people bring understanding and enlightenment. So uh, touch my tongue, uh, touch my mind, and Lord, let us learn today uh, more of you, and we pray that you would always be glorified in all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're so grateful. We are reading now the last few chapters or reviewing them, chapters 63 through 66, and this will be the end of our study of Isaiah. Praise the Lord. Next screen. Okay, we have gone through chapters 1 through 62, and now we are at the final chapters about God's masterpiece of his glory and grace. Amen. These are the chapters that we've reviewed. This, ev this uh, evening, we're going to be looking at chapter 63, praise and prayer. Chapter 64, a prayer for help. Chapter 65, judgment and a final salvation, and chapter 66, Zion's future hope. Amen. Okay, we're going to start off with chapter 63, verses 7 through, two, through 19. We, we read up until 63, verses 1 through 6, the last time that we met, and we're finishing up with this chapter of 63, prayer and praise. I will tell of the Lord's unfailing love. I will praise the Lord for all he has done. I will rejoice in his great goodness to Israel, which he had granted according to his mercy and love. He said, they are my very own people. Surely they will not betray me again. And he became their savior and all their suffering. He also suffered and he personally rescued them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. So Isaiah is, is, um, is the prophet that's speaking of God's greatness, of God's love. Isaiah has really has had a yeoman's job uh, in these last few chapters of Isaiah. He's really spoken in many different voices. He's spoken as, as we have seen right here. He's spoken as the prophet. 
Then he speaks in, uh, and he communicates the voice of God the Father. He also uh, reveals this Messiah, this suffering servant that's coming down from heaven who's going to come and, and be all that is needed to be done to be able to um, redeem Israel. And then we also learn that he's redeeming Israel. In redeeming Israel, he's also going to be redeeming the entire world. We get, get a glimpse of God's ultimate plan. His ultimate plan is for his people to be uh, a remnant of his people to be a sign to the world of who this great God is. But he also knows that through the, the many messenger, messengers and messages that he sent, that God only himself can, can come and redeem his people. And so this suffering servant is revealed and he speaks through the voice of the suffering servant, part of what we've just seen right there, if we can go back to that last verse. And then we also hear from the people. So Isaiah is really, I mean, this prophet is used mightily to really kind of reveal this whole plan. We see, you know, the prophets can speak in many different ways, um, through oracles, through sermons, through dialogues. So part of what was going on was this dialogue, this great dialogue that was happening in these last few chapters, short narratives and performances. So uh, we, so, some, of, some of what we've read have been oracles, some of them have been what we've been called songs. There have been a combination. This prophet is very skilled. This prophet is really um, using everything that God has given him to proclaim the message of God, Yahweh. So right here, he's again reiterating back what this suffering servant who has emerged is speaking. Um, he said, talking about God, they are my very own people. Surely they will not betray me again. And he became their savior and all their suffering. He also suffered. And he personally rescued them in his love and mercy. He redeemed them. Amen. So this is God's ultimate plan. And, and, the, and Isaiah is talking about that. He's revealing it. He's reiterating it back to the people. Let's go on. He said, okay, but they rebelled against him and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he became their enemy and fought against them. Next verse. Then they remembered those days of old when Moses led his people out of Egypt and they cried out, where is the one who brought Israel through the sea? Where is the one who sent his Holy Spirit to be among his people? Let's go on. Where is the one whose power was displayed? The one who's divided the sea before them? Where is the one who led them through the bottom of the sea? You led your people, Lord, and gained a magnificent reputation. <laughs> Come on, let's read some more. Lord, look down from heaven. Look from your holy, glorious home and see us. Where is the passion and the might you used to show on, your, on our behalf? Where are your mercy and compassion now? Let's go on. Surely you are still our father. Even if Abraham and Jacob would disown us, Lord, you would still be our father. You are our redeemer from ages past. Lord, why have you allowed us to turn from our path, from your path? Why have you given us stubborn hearts so we no longer fear you? Return and help us, for we are your servants, the tribes that are your special possession. So we see here um, over and over who God is, who his people are. Uh, God's response to their cry, the people crying out, uh, wanting what they want, but then also recognizing that there is, they have nothingness, that they need God to deliver them, even from their own failings, even from their inabilities, even from their own uselessness and inability to be rescued from themselves. You know, that is the greatness of who God is. That's the wonder of who God is, is that even in everything that we have and even in all of our abundance, we recognize it is nothing. 
and, and the children of Israel had to come to that conclusion. They thought they were something. God made them something. Then they thought they were something in their own strength. Then they uh, became um, uh, uh, overtaken by the practices, the religion, uh, uh, the falseness of other gods. Uh, then they, their heart strayed away from God. Then they didn't rely on him. Then God had to remove himself from them. And then they fell, uh, they fell into exile. They were over, over, oppressed. They were taken over. And then they cried out to God. They had to recognize not only just rescue us, God, but they had to be honest in their true repentance that it was us. And God, if you give us a heart, then we'll, we'll be able to have a heart that's after you. God, we give you ourselves. We're crying out to you. That's a great moment that we all need to come to. Not just to say, God, help and rescue me. But really, after we pull that back, after we pull that aside, after we really look down at the heart of the matter, we have to recognize that it was our own sin and that we need God to come in and do a sin uh, to, to take, take, um, do something for us in, in terms of our sin. Not just to be this God outwardly who's doing these great things, but really in the midst of our heart. Our heart has to be pure before him and to recognize that we can't do it except he does it in us and through us. Amen. Let's keep going. So let's, we're now going to chapter 64. Chapter 64, a prayer for help. All oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake for your presence. As fire causes wood to burn and water to boil, your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. When you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations. For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. My God. But you have been very angry with us. For we are not godly. We are constant sinners. Woo. How can people like us be saved? We are infected with impure uh, and impure with sins. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Yet no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore, you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. My God. You know, God is just saying, just, just acknowledge. But we don't even do that. We don't even do that. And yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all formed by your hand. Don't be angry with us, Lord. Don't remember our sins forever. Look at us, we pray, and see that we are, are all your people. Your holy cities are destroyed. Zion is a wilderness. Yes, Jerusalem is a desolate ruin. The holy and beautiful temple where our ancestors praised you has been burned down and all of the things of beauty are destroyed. Let me just say something to you. It's real important for us to understand. We start off in sin and, um, and then, you know, we don't think that sin has a final recourse. You know, even in the book of Genesis, when, when God is saying, you know, that uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, that they will surely die, you know, they didn't die right away. They were, they were, they had a spirit and they inhabited a body and they were supposed to live forever with the Lord. But sin brought a point of judgment. Sin brought death. And so what they, what they didn't recognize or what they didn't see when they were still flourishing, that sin has a time and destination. And so now they're seeing what sin has done. Sin will bring things down in your life. Sin will cause desolation. Sin will cause you to look back and say, my God, what happened to my life? And that's what happened to them. Everything was taken away. Even they were removed from the place that they inhabited, the, beauty, the beautiful place that God allowed them to have. And so now they're saying, you know, look at all of this that's happened. Look at all the ruin that's happened, right? And this is all because 
God has left us, and it's all because of our sin. Let's go. Amen. So let's just keep that in mind. This was continuing from chapter 63 into 64. You know, we, we break them up into chapters, but really this is a continual discussion that the people are having with God. Isaiah is talking from his perspective as a prophet. He's also talking from God's perspective. He's talking about the servant that became the sacrifice, who, who was sent to redeem, and he's also talking from the people's perspective. And remember, the Lord, um, the prophet, is God is using the prophet to display all of this, for them to have it written down, for, them, for this to be spoken to them, so that they can see this, and for them to understand this is for our understanding. The word of the Lord is for our understanding. We have to see this. We are spiritual Israel, and we have found ourselves in the same place. Amen? We have found ourselves in the same place. This is for us to look on and to find our place, ourselves always in a place of repentance, always looking at our heart, always looking at our motives, making sure that we have not been co-opted by this world, but that we are a, a people that reflects a God that is holy. Amen. Let's read it next, chapter 65. I was ready to respond. Now God is responding back to them, right? They put on this, they, 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 they spoke these words to him. You did so many great things, this God of old. You know, now they're remembering. <laughs> See, now you remember when you've been knocked down, you remember how good you had it. You remember how great you had it. Your heart was pulled away, and you thought everything in the world was so great. You want to reflect what the world looks like. You want to be like the world. And now when the world has you and beats you down and takes everything from you, now you remember how great God was, how he sustained you, how he kept you, how he caused you to prosper, right? You remember those things, how your grandmother had it and how your grandfather had it and the, those, those things that they taught you and they had a little bit, but they were able to have so much provision. Now you remember. And so now they remember and they're calling on God. And so now God is responding back to them. Remember I talked to you about these dialogues. This is how the prophet will speak. I was ready to respond, but no one asked for help. That was pride, y'all. I was ready to be found, but no one was looking for me. Now, when they had it good, God was telling them, this is what's going to happen to you. Answer me. I'm calling you. I'm calling. I'm trying to get your, your attention, but they didn't want to hear that. So now he's telling them about themselves. I was ready to be found, but no one was looking for me. I said, here I am, here I am. All day long, I opened my arms to a rebellious people, but they follow their own evil plans and their own crooked schemes. All day long, they insult me to my face by worshiping idols in their sacred gardens. They burn incense on pagan altars. All night they go out among the graves, worshiping the dead. They eat the flesh of pigs and make stew with other foreign foods. So um, this is really important. We talked a little bit about this before, but um, God is exposing um, how they've incorporated these other religious practices, and now they're trying to present it to God. They're trying to present it these things as these things as being religious and holy. And God is saying, "This is I have nothing to do with any of this." So He exposed their pagan worship. He exposed them being involved with unclean things. He exposed their ancestral worship. He exposed them burning incense. Let's keep going. Let's read some more. I'm going to look at some of these. Yes, they say to each other, don't come too close or you don't, won't defile me. I'm holier than you. These people are a stench in my nostrils, an acrid smell that never goes away. Look, my decrees is written out in front of me. I will not stand silent. I will repay them in full. I want to let you know that these things, these practices that people are involved in. If you've been, you know, these, this is a new thing. It's, it went away, it wasn't as prominent, but now this ancestral worship. People that are Christians, that know that Christ is the answer, 
are now going back to ancestral worship. They're taking incense and burning it in their house and sage, and they're saying this is God. God is saying these are practices. No matter what the world is telling you, this is not what brings my presence. This is not what clears the air. The Holy Spirit is the very presence that you should have. So be very careful. Be very careful. Don't take on, the, there are many, many voices, many theologies, many practices. But when you start really getting into worshiping other gods, bringing idolatry into the, 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 the holiness of the worship that you have to uh, the only God, God says you will have to pay. There are curses. There are, there's damnation. There's judgment. God is very serious about it. His worship has to be pure. Amen. Yes, I will repay them both for their own sins and for those of their ancestors, says the Lord. Amen. So you are picking up these things from your ancestors and you're continuing with these practices. Amen. There are some things that my grandmother was involved in that I'm not involved in. Amen. And I loved her dearly. And she's gone on to be with the Lord because she's separated herself from those things. Amen. When she got an understanding, she got a clear understanding. And so there was a time of repentance and separating from those things. What would it look like that now I take on those same practices and I employ them in my own home and in my generations? God forbid. Amen. They burned incense on the mountains and insulted me on the hills. I will pay them back in full, but I will not destroy them all, says the Lord. For just as a good grapes are found among a cluster of bad ones, and someone will say, don't throw, throw them all away. Some of those grapes are good, so I will not destroy all Israel. For I still have true servants there, I will preserve a remnant of people in Israel and of Judah to possess my land. But because of the rest of you have forsaken the Lord and have forgotten his temple and become, uh, and because you have prepared feasts to honor the God of fate and have offered mixed wine to the God of destiny, now I will destine you for the sword. Okay, so let's talk here a little bit about um, this is very, very important to God. You know, and I find this happening now. They used to worship uh, these idols, the God of fate and the God of destiny. And I want to say to you that, that we have gotten caught up in a lot of these practices that occur here now. We're going to seek, quote unquote, prophets, trying to get a word from the Lord every five minutes. We go to soothsayers. We go to those that will read our palms. We're looking outwardly. We're looking outwardly for people to tell us something about what our future is going to be. And we can't even live successfully now walking hand in hand with the Lord. These things are condemned. And we find people who have gifts, whether these gifts are, 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 are under the auspices that God is, the Holy Spirit has given them, or they've gotten these gifts through another power. This is not the will of God. God is not expecting us every five minutes to go and to try to get a word from the Lord. This is not from God. So we have to, we have to, we have to understand that our life is hid in Christ and that God has a plan for our lives. And so what we have to do is when we position ourselves, when we walk according to the will of God, that plan will unfold. Amen? So we have to be very, very careful that we are not like the world who's trying to seek supposedly the will of God every five minutes. Let me read something to you from God Questions. God blesses the obedient and he is patient with those who disobey, even to the point of seeming laxity. He has a plan for our lives, which includes our joy and his glory, both in this world and the world to come. Those who accept Christ as Savior has accepted God's plan. From then on, it's a step-by-step -step following of God's best for us, praying his will to be done and avoiding the sidetracks. Amen. Let's be careful not to get caught up in the practices of this world to seek a soothsayer every five minutes trying to figure out 
what God has for us. He will unfold it. And this is how when we walk according to his will, amen, God's will will be done. Amen. So we have to be very, very careful about this God of fate and this God of destiny that people are seeking after. And it's now infiltrated the house of God. The Lord really talks here about the servant. Who is the servant that he's talking about? Who is this remnant? These are the people that seek the Lord to please him. These are the people that answers him when he calls. He's reiterated this several times. When I called, you didn't answer, right? When I, when I sought for you, you wouldn't be found, right? The people that want to please God. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I'm going to give God this. But if he didn't call for that and he called for this, then this is what he requires of you. You can't give God something that you want to give him when he's asking for something else. Your obedience is better than any sacrifice than you, that you can offer. So I want to let you know when he calls, you as a servant of the Lord will answer. When the Lord is tugging on your heart, you're going to respond. That's what being a servant of the Lord is. Someone and the Lord will give you, uh, uh, and, and the Lord sees you as uh, 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 someone who has a submissive spirit, who's submitting to his will. In contrast, those that are trying to control their own destiny through religious behavior, through religious practices, are not his true servants. And we mentioned, there was a mention earlier of those that were full of self-righteousness, those who are looking down at others, those who want to have positions, thinking that that's going to give them spiritual power with God. Those are things that are not pleasing to him, and that's not the heart of a servant. Let's keep going. But when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not listen. You deliberately sinned before my very eyes and chose to do what you know I despise. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My servants will eat, but you will starve. My servants will drink, but you will be thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you will be sad and ashamed. My servants will sing for joy, but you will cry in sorrow and despair. Look, I'm creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will ever think about the old ones anymore. Be glad and rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and delight in my people, and the sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. You know, these are wonderful um, these are wonderful promises that God has given. When, when his remnant, when his people, when his servants, right, do his will, then what's going to happen is that your life is going to overflow. The, the, the Israel will be returned back when the remnant returns back to him. When the people return back to him, when the true servants return back to him, then, that, then the God calls you to prosper and to flourish. This is what he's saying. Amen. Let's keep reading. No longer will babies die when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they have lived a full life. No longer will people be considered old at 100. People will live in the houses they built and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. Let's keep going. Unlike the past, invaders will not take their houses and confiscate their vineyards. For my people will live as long as trees, and my chosen ones will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. They will not work in vain, and their children will not be doomed to misfortune. Let me tell you, these are some promises. You need to write this down. You need to highlight it in your book. If you're a true servant of the Lord, then you can declare this word over your life, over your household, over your bodies. This is what the Lord is saying. These are the promises of God, my God, and the promises of God are yea and amen. These are the promises that God gave to Israel once they're returning back to Jerusalem. 
once they've submitted to his will, once they've acknowledged and repented of their sin, these are the promises that God has given. And as spiritual Israel, we can also declare and stand on these promises. When something's trying to invade your life, you need to declare this word. When something's trying to overtake your body, you need to declare this word. When things are going on, wrong in your household, you need to declare this word. When it seems like you're, 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 um, you're working and it seems like things are not stable there, you need to declare this word. Amen. Glory to God. But they are people blessed by the Lord and their children too will be blessed. I will answer them before they even call me. While they are yet still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. We need to stand on this word. I want you to highlight it and write it down. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion and the ox shall eat straw from the same trowel. But snakes shall eat dust. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. I, the Lord, have spoken. So God is saying the wolf, those who seem to be a predator, those who seem to be against you, God is going to cause them to sit with you. God is going to cause peace. And this is what he's saying to Israel. It seemed like there were wolves all around you. You're a little tiny nation. And it looked like there were wolves all around you. It looked like you could be overtaken at any moment. But God is saying, I, I will grant you grace. I will bring all of the people myself and cause everyone to work for you and you on or on, on and on your behalf amen but the devil that snake shall continue to eat the dust and let me tell you those that are living according to the world they shall not prevail um and they shall they shall not be able to um have victory so let's make sure you're a true servant let's not be those who are walking earthly and worldly amen because the Lord is saying, if you are the true servant, this enemy of the world shall not prevail over you, shall not prevail over the works of God, and the sovereign grace of God shall be your portion. Keep that in mind. That's why you have to separate yourself from the world. You have to separate yourself from earthly things, right? From worldly things so that you can reap the blessing, the overtaking blessing of the Lord. It will be a part of your life. It shall be a part of your generations. Amen? Let's go. Chapter 66, Zion's future hope. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Can you build me a temple as good as that? Can you build me such a resting place? God is answering the people back. Let's go. My hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts who tremble at my word, but those who choose their own ways, delighting in their, in their death, detestable sins, I will not have their offerings accepted. So we can't fool ourselves. We cannot fool ourselves believing that we can still bring ourselves, we can still bring a, a, a people before the Lord that has decided not to really follow after him. Because when you follow after God, all these other things will fall away from you. When you follow after God, these, these practices, these ways, you will forsake and take on the things that are pleasing to the Lord. When such people sacrifice a bull, it is no more acceptable than a human sacrifice. When they sacrifice a lamb, it's as though they have sacrificed a dog. Do you see that? When we come before the Lord as his people... And we try to present something to him that, and, and ourselves that are not holy, God is saying it's, it's, it's detestable to him. Can you believe that? We think that we can just come any kind of way. We know who God is. We're in a relationship with him. I gave an example uh, recently, and I was saying, you know, I'm in a relationship with my husband. And we've been married almost 19 years. This year will be 19 years. And he went to the, 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 the bakery and he brought some things home. And, you know, he, he likes certain things. And so he presented something to me. And he says, listen, I got this for you because this is what you like. And I looked at it and I said to myself, this is not what I like. 
You know, I like, you know, eclairs. I like um, a strawberry shortcake. I like black and whites. And he brought me something else. He likes Danish. He brought me what he liked, but he didn't bring me what I liked. And so it, it got me, it made me angry and it made me frustrated saying, how could we be married all of these years? I knew you even before we were in a covenant relationship. And now that we're in a relationship for almost 19 years, you're presenting something to me that's not acceptable. You're telling me this is what I like, and I'm telling you this is not what I like. I've never told you this is what I've liked. And it becomes the same thing with God. We're in a relationship with him, and we just bring what we want to, telling God, this is what you like. This is acceptable to you. And God becomes very angry with that. He says, no. This is this is this makes me so angry. It's, it's as if you are as if you're bringing me dung. It's as if you're bringing me uh, 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 something that is so egregious to me. And we can't imagine we're bringing a sacrifice to God, and we're it's like we're bringing a human sacrifice. We can't imagine that we're bringing something to Him, and it's like killing a dog. We can't imagine that. But that's how God sees it. He's giving us examples. He's giving us ways that we can understand. You know, the prophet, just like Jesus, you know, g gives us examples of things. God is helping us bringing things down to our limited mind so that we can understand what he's really talking about. We, he's giving us an image. So let us look at these things that he's showing us so that we have an example of how God feels about these things. Let's go on. When they bring an offering of grain, they might as well offer a blood, the blood of a pig. When they burn frankincense, it's as if that they have blessed an idol. My God. Let's go on. I will send them great trouble, all the things they feared. But when I called, they did not answer. And when I spoke, they did not listen. Again, this is this theme. I want you to really write this down. When I called, they didn't answer. When I spoke, they didn't listen. God has been saying this and reiterating to this. Even before this prophet is closing out, in these last few chapters, God keeps saying the same thing. Don't you be a servant of the Lord and don't answer when he calls. Don't be a servant of the Lord when God speaks that you're not listening or paying attention. Amen. They deliberately sinned before me, my very eyes, and chose to do what they know I despise. Hear this message from the Lord, all you who tremble at his words. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, Jerusalem delivered a male child. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has a country ever come forth in a mere moment? Would I ever bring this nation to the point of birth and then not deliver it, says, asked the Lord? No, I will never keep this nation from being born, says the Lord. I will give Jerusalem a river of peace and prosperity. The wealth of the nations will flow to her. And even today, Jerusalem is known throughout the entire world. It's a place where, where everyone knows where the Lord has spoken, where the Lord has set his hand upon Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was, was um, given back to the, to the Jews in, in the early 1900s or early, yeah, early 1900s. And so Jerusalem, not only did the people return back to Jerusalem then with Isaiah and the Lord was speaking to it, but even centuries later, as the children of Israel were scattered, they get, again returned back. So Isaiah is one of those prophets that were not only speaking then, but he was also speaking to a future time. Remember, we have cycles. If we continue, we come back to the Lord, but if we, come, we give ourselves over to sin again, we will then be exiled again. We will then have separation. So this is a cycle that's continued for Israel um, and for Jerusalem, but we have to know God's hand of blessing. God, what God has spoken over Jerusalem shall stand forever. And so God is speaking and saying, hey, the nations and the wealth of the nations will flow to her. Israel is, is, is not only uh, what we would consider the center of the Middle East, 
but it really is a place known throughout the world. Nations and the wealth of nations flow to her and flow through her. Let's go on. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart will rejoice, and the hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants, and his indignation to his enemies. God's indignation will be by fire. Those that indulge in, in, indulge in impurities and those who worship idols. I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I'll send the survivors of judgment all over the world, Spain and Africa, Turkey and Greece, and the far off islands that I have never heard of me who knows nothing of what I've done, nor who I am, I will send them as missionaries to preach my glory among the Gentile nations. They will bring the remnant of your people back from every nation. So I, I just want to um, remember, I just want to reiterate God's plan, God's ultimate plan. God's ultimate plan is that the people, uh, the whole world would know of him. Remember, God's relationship with Israel was really a, 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 a prototype. It was to let the whole world know who God is and who he will be to those that will know him and accept him. But remember, ultimately, with Israel rejecting God and not following after him, God promises that he's going to pull a remnant out of um, Israel and send those remnant all over the world to share who he is. And this is really speaking of uh, what God's plan is, what's going now that when, with, the, with Christ coming in the New Testament and the Messiah coming to fulfill the word and the Messiah dying, the Messiah now sitting on the right hand of the Father, which we know is Jesus, and God uh, charging and anointing and sending forth this remnant, this Jewish remnant all over the world to spread this gospel. The gospel is still being spread. Amen? The gospel is still being spread. Isaiah was speaking of this. Even then he was speaking of what would happen millennials later. Let's go on. They'll bring them straight to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says God. They'll present them just as Israelites present their offerings in the ceremonial vessel in the temple of God. Just as the new heavens and the new earth that I am making will stand firm before me, God's decree. So will you always be my people with a name that will never disappear. And it shall come to pass from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all humanity will come to worship me, God says. And as they go out, they will see the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. Amen. God has a, 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 um, a covenant with those that will have a covenant with him. God will bless those, whether you're of, of Israel, and if you're not of Israel, but you will follow after him and keep his decrees, God will have a covenant with you, and this will be a covenant of blessing. Amen. So we're so grateful uh, for this study of Isaiah. What a powerful prophet what a powerful prophet. Uh, some prophets only spoke of what was going to come within the next few years, the next 60 years, the next 80 years, the next 100 years. But Isaiah was one of those chosen prophets that spoke of what would happen now, then, and that what is going on now. Um, so so the, the book of Isaiah um, really talked about the covenants that God had, uh, uh, Isaiah was a great prophet of God. He proclaimed uh, divine revelations of God. He uh, uh, spoke through oracles and dialogues. Amen. Um, and, and the book of Isaiah was called the fifth gospel. <laughs> the fifth gospel. So um, every New Testament writer referenced Isaiah. Every New Testament writer referenced Isaiah, the son of Amos. We've learned in the book of Isaiah um, 
how God is saying, uh, I'm taking a reference from Exodus, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. And God took that very seriously. And so what we've learned is that Isaiah, the people of Israel had a challenge with nominal devotion and paganism. And God was calling them to a place of authenticity. Uh, we've learned that Isaiah had three sections, uh, chapters 1 through 35. We're talking about um, uh, the warnings of God and the hope that we have through, through God. We, we then talked, we had a period of time of talking about some hysteric, uh, um, historical interlude where we were talking about some very specific things that were going on in the kingdom of Israel. And then now we've now concluded with the masterpiece of God's glory and grace, where God was, uh, through this prophet, was talking over and over uh, and revealing his ultimate plan for all humanity. This prophet was awesome. This prophet was uh, handpicked by God, was a chosen vessel of the Lord. Uh, this um, prophet experienced dreams and angelic visitations. This prophet was a prophet that God spoke to and trusted um, and revealed uh, his plan. Um, and he spoke uh, uh, through many voices the very mind of God. Um, this prophet was calling the people back uh, to God. He gave them a charge from God. Um, he spoke to this, their state of apostasy and their backslidden state. And he talked to them about judgments, not only for them, but for the nations that surrounded them, uh, that were a part of the judgment for Israel, but they themselves were going to be judged because of their own sins. Um, God spoke to the corruption of the people and how they turned their backs on him. He spoke how they, they entertained murderers and thieves and they were hungry for power and that they uh, were impressed by riches. Uh, they were impressed by soothsayers and idolaters um, and how they turned to idol worship. My God, help us. Uh, he sent warnings. He sent warning after warning. He then did what he said he was going to do. And as the people finally called out to him, and as they finally recognized uh, what was truly uh, uh, in their hearts and confessed those things, and as they finally recognized their own failings, uh, as they called upon him, asking for God to be God, to be their father again, not just to be the God who performed all these miracles in the past. Yes, they did talk about that, and they did bring that up before the Lord. But when they finally got down to the matter, they said, Lord, we can't even rescue ourselves. <laughs> we even see the condition of our heart. Don't leave us in this state <laughs> and rescue us. And so God begins to encourage them as they reposition their hearts. He encouraged them through the prophet. He sent words of encouragement. And then he began to reveal uh, this suffering servant who will come and do this great work uh, that needs to happen. He will redeem them. He will, he will um, uh, take their place. He will suffer for, on their behalf. They think they're suffering. Well, there's a suffering servant that will come, that will suffer on their behalf, that will take their place. And then he speaks of these great promises for this remnant, for these servants uh, that will follow after him. This great prophet was very mighty, and God used him mightily. And uh, like I shared before, this prophet's words were re referenced in the New Testament um, and through all of the Gospels. This prophet spoke not only uh, to what was happening at that moment, but this prophet, prophet spoke even till now to what's going on now and God's future plans with a new earth and a new heaven. We are so grateful for this great study of this book of Isaiah. I encourage you to really go back, especially in these last uh, chapters, 
to really write down some of these promises, to write down what uh, God has promised that he's going to do through his servant, through the Messiah, uh, who we now know is Jesus, uh, how he's going to suffer on our behalf and what we're going to receive once he takes on the sin, once, once he becomes accursed for us. My God, we're no longer under these curses, but we have to remain pure and we have to rem remain as a submitted servant. I pray this lesson has been uh, um, the lessons that we've studied through Isaiah since the beginning of the year, since uh, February, that these have blessed you and encouraged you. Write the word down. Read it over and over. This word will lift you up. This word will bring you victory. This word will cancel the assignments of the enemy and bring you out of dark places. This word will put you and reposition you back into a place where your heart and mind are presented to the Lord in a pure fashion. And then these overtaking blessings will be your portion. If you would like to give and support our Bible study, there are different ways to give that's presented on your screen. Several different ways. We're so grateful for that. Of course, you can come and send a check to us, but you can pay by Zelle. You can also pay online. You can also pay by PayPal and by Cash App. Let's close out in prayer. Gracious Father, you are so loving and kind to us. Though you sit high, you look low. And though, Lord, we have been a people that have not always followed after you, like spiritual Israel, we confess our sin. And Lord, we reposition ourselves today. We commit that we're getting rid of all of these practices that are according to the world and not according to your word. We commit, Lord, that uh, we're, we're going to dismantle, uh, Lord, all of these uh, uh, beliefs that we have that we've taken on from the world. And we're going to engross ourselves in the word of God so that our minds will be pure before you. We commit, Lord, that we're going to honor the Sabbath that we're going to delight in you. And Lord, we, we uh, commit tonight that we're going to uh, accept Jesus Christ, the Messiah, this suffering servant into our lives. That Lord, all of the blessings that you promise and all of the promises that you've given, Lord, shall be a part of our lives so that we can be blessed and walk in peace. Lord, we uh, enjoy you. We enjoy what you've given to us and how you continue to give. Lord, let your hand rest upon us and never leave us. Always light the path. Always show us the way to go. Speak to our hearts, for we will be a people that will listen. Lord, speak to us, Lord, and we will be a people, Lord, that will acknowledge you and do what you tell us to do. We say today, we are the servants of the Lord, and Lord, we shall be the people that you're looking for in the last and evil days. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you.